So I'm so pleased to be able to speak with you today and honored. And today we're going to talk about symptom management and metastatic breast cancer. So I'd like to say first, I have no relevant disclosures, unfortunately. So what I'm hoping to accomplish, what I'm hoping to accomplish today is that we're going to evaluate common symptoms and, um, and treatment strategies um, for women who are um, living with metastatic breast cancer. Um, we're going to identify um, support services that can help manage um, some of those um, symptoms. So I want, excuse me, sorry. I'm hoping to start with, we're going to focus on a few symptoms um, a little bit in more detail because those tend to be the ones that plague at least most of my patients, which are pain, fatigue, um, mucositis, and nausea. Although in the q and I'm hoping to address other, other symptoms, other symptoms as well. So when you think about pain, we know what exactly is pain? While it's an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with actual or potential um, tissue damage described in such terms of that damage. So that's a very technical, um, that's a very technical definition, but really what it's saying is that it's the, the experience of pain is not just what you're experiencing in the moment and what's being, which, what's the area of damage, but it's also an emotional experience. And when you think about pain, pain is going to be personal and it's going to be influenced by degrees by your biological, social, and psychological factors. Um, pain and where the pain is or the level of illness does not necessarily always correlate. So it cannot always be solely inferred from the activity or those sensory neurons. So I often have patients will say, well, I have meds to the bone and I don't have any pain. I'm like, you don't have pain. And I'll other have patients who say, well, you know, I have, right now I currently have no evidence of disease and I'm really in, in pain in an area that I had a metastasis. And I'm like, yeah, you're actually in pain from there. There's not always a correlation. And how we manage pain is through our life experiences and also our concept of pain. Uh, we should, as providers, we should always respect the, re support, um, the report of pain. And although pain can be helpful to us to let us know things are wrong, um, at times it, become, it can become a maladaptive and it can interfere with your ability to function and your psychological well-being because your pain is like your warning signal. And the verbal prescription description is only one of several behaviors to express pain. We express it through our body language, through what we're able to do, how social we are. So we'll go ahead and examine that a little bit more. So when I think about pain, mostly I like to think about the concept of total pain, which was coined by Dame Cicely Saunders, who's famous in our field. And it's the combination of what you're experiencing, not only physically, which is due to the disease and treatments, but now it's also the psychological um, distress that it could um, cause, the anger, fear, the fear of suffering, and the depression, especially as it um, leaps into chronic pain, and chronic pain is pain lasting greater than three months in varying um, degrees. There's also social part of pain, where there's a loss of role, status, job, financial concerns, and then also the spiritual um, aspect of pain, where people will experience pain when they've lost meaning or have the fear of the unknown. So when we think about breast cancer, we often, you know, when you're talking to your providers about pain, they ask you all these questions, which I know patients find annoying. Like I hurt right here, and then the doctor's asking you 20 questions, and it's hard to um, quantify. But what we're really trying to figure out is what kind of pain you're having. So there are three types of pain, somatic. So those are, that's going to be the pain that's arising from bones, joints, muscles, and skin. So for people who have been on aromatase inhibitors, that achy joint pain, that somatic pain, bone metabolism metastasis, the arthralgias and myalgias that come from chemotherapy like the and targeted immunotherapy are the taxanes. The visceral pain is the vein that is in the organs, and that's very diffuse, kind of achy and sharp, hard to localize. So that may be if you have liver mets or mets to your kidneys or bowel colic due to cancer, constipation or obstruction. 
Neuropathic pain is when there's injury to the nerve system. And when that can happen through chemo, um, chemotherapy, such as the taxels and the platinums, and even radiation necrosis that um, unfortunately women can experience, you know, well after um, um, treatment to, for targeted um, radiation. That pain is often described as burning or a feeling of discomfort, swelling, sweating, bugs crawling. And so why we care about what kind of pain is that pain is going to kind of direct our treatment. And most of the time, the pain is mixed. So you just don't have just one kind. So how do we start to think about treating pain or how should you start to think about it? Well, if the pain's fairly mild, we always refer back to this um, World Health Organiz Organization um, analgesic ladder, which has really recently been modified. So when you first start having pain, which is acute, um, you might start off with non-opiates like non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. So it's gonna be your Motrin, your ibuprofens, your naproxens. Um, and then, and or or acetaminophen, um, which are not non-steroidals, but actually help with pain. Um, if the pain is continuing, you may progress on to weak opioids, which is really a misnomer. It just means that you know the opioids we're not as afraid of. So that's when you're hitting your tramadols and maybe your hydrocodones. The strong opioids like methadone or morphine or fentanyl is usually in step three when the pain is starting to ratchet up. That's when you're living in an area of maybe six to eight. And then step four is when we start, um, when the World Health Organization states, you should be considering like nerve blocks, epidurals, PCA pumps, and some of the larger invasive places for pain. Um, for cancer patients, this doesn't always work. And I like to sort of flip it on this head. I often take stage four and start looking at stage four earlier, because if you can get at the source of why you're having the pain, like with a nerve block, there's no reason to really wait to go through all of these steps. You should be able to do them simultaneously. And that's why the modified ladder has neurosurgical procedures a little bit over here to show that it's more of a continuum versus a stepwise ladder. But this is how your providers are thinking. That's why they oh, that's why they always suggest the procedure last. You're like, well, you, you could have told me I could have blocked this nerve or I could have had this done earlier. Why did you, you know, put me through 700 medicines? So this is one way to think about advocating for yourself. So the types of medications are the therapeutic options, like I call traditional pharmacology that we have for pain. You think of the non-opioids, the systemic, the topicals. Um, opioids still remain the standard of care for um, patients who have um, cancer pain. Uh, but they do have long-term um, side effects if you, a long -term, with long-term use has side effects. And then the other side, I have some of the co-analgesics or adjuvant treatments. So when you hear adjuvants, those are medications that we add onto your traditional um, um, pain medications um, to help them work better. Now we know that sometimes pain is best managed sometimes just by the adjuvants. Um, and we might start with those first, like the if the duloxetines and the gabapentins. If you just have grade one, like neuropathic pain, it's just starting, we may not need to um, go to opioids quite yet. And that's actually something that you should be able to ask for. So I want to spend a little time, um, you know, so once the opioid crisis hit and all the doctors, we all lost our minds. Um, I do want to explain a little bit why providers are not wanting to give these out for long term. Um, because now with the treatments be getting better and women living longer, you're, you could start e even to start to experience some of these side effects that we didn't have, that we didn't worry about before because our treatments weren't um, as good. So there is, for long-term use, cardiovascular side effects, which increase risk of heart attack and stroke. Um, there are some um, opioid medications that you can interfere with the conduction of your heart, usually at very high doses, and that's not something that happens com commonly or routinely, but everybody's always afraid of that. Um, constipation, nausea, vomiting, falls, we kind of know about those. There can be immunosuppression, so morphine tends to suppress cellular immunity and can decrease risk to infection, so you may provide that providers for people who are getting multiple infections may steer away from that opioid. And the opioid buprenorphine, and buprenorphine is probably the one that's rising to the top right now. And what's really great about that, it's an opiate 
agonist and antagonist. So it works on the opioid receptor and against it. So you don't get the same level of respiratory depression and some of the other side effects. It's very safe. But often people have, but it does carry a stigma because people are used to seeing this in the world of opioid use disorder at higher doses with medications you might have heard of like Suboxone and Subutex. But they're actually great pain medications. You're seeing providers use these buprenorphine preparations either in a patch or film or even Subutex or Suboxone, not for opioid misuse disorder, just because it has less side effects and it's a great um, pain medication. And most of the time you can drive and work and do and feel more like yourself on this versus the traditional opioids. The other things it does is it can reduce testosterone levels, um, interfere with sexual dysfunction, bring back those hot flashes and create fatigue. It can increase risk of metabolic syndrome um, and, and um, worsen estrogen deficiency and long-term use can lead to osteo, increase your risk of osteoporosis and fracture. Other side effects, um, um, it, it is a, it can, they can act as a depressant. Buprenorphine doesn't tend to do that. Buprenorphine can trend you towards weight loss though. Um, if you take, if, if you become neurotoxic with it, which means that your cells, you get to a certain amount and your body starts having these jerks. I have people who will drink coffee and the coffee flies. They're not having a seizure. It's just letting us know that's the top limit that they can use. Some of the opioids have anticholinergic effects. So if you're over the age of 65, and what basically what that means and can re increase risk of falls, urinary retention and confusion. Um, again, and then also you think about respiratory depression and people have trouble breathing, there is a limit to what you can use um, because you have to be careful that it doesn't um, use res suppress respiratory depression, but you really have to be on higher doses. That's when we're approaching like 100 milligrams, 200 milligrams a day. And then um, another thing that plagues women a lot and all of our patients is dry mouth, which can affect our oral health. So, so when we move on to our another one of our other um, symptoms that really plague us is cancer-related fatigue, and that's the distressing, persistent, subjective sense of physical, emotional, and cognitive tiredness. It's exhaustion related to cancer or cancer treatment, and it's not proportional to the recent activity that interferes with your usual function. So all of those fancy words are basically saying, I say, cancer-related fatigue is the fatigue of ignition. So like if you have a car, it's like you just can't turn the car over. Once the car is driving, you can complete the whole task. Um, you're tired afterwards, but you can do it. But the idea of even starting to do it seems almost impossible. So I say it's the fatigue of ignition. And oftentimes it causes people to feel pretty badly about themselves or feel like they're being lazy when they're not. It's just, you know, that's the fatigue and it's its own illness. It has its own set of cytokines and things happening in your body. I'll spare that, but just know it's not something that you can will yourself to get over. The prevalence of uh, cancer related fatigue um, and active treatment ranges somewhere between 25 to 99%. So most people are, it will end up with it. 30 to 60% of patients report moderate to severe fatigue during therapy. It usually improves after the first year following treatment completion. So as you say, as you read that, it didn't say it went away, it improves. And it can persist in some form up to five years after treatment. So I often see cancer, um, people with cancer survivors, and they're wondering why I'm still tired. And I want to kind of normalize that experience. It can be cancer-related fatigue is more severe and persistent and debilitated than normal fatigue. So you can't sleep it and it's not caused by overexertion. It's nothing that you're doing wrong. It's not relieved by adequate sleep or rest. That ignition isn't. Exercise has been the one thing and the consistent thing that has been shown to improve it. So when a patient tells me I'm extremely tired, I can't, I can't even conceive of putting on my shoes, their palliative care doctor says, that's when I want you to walk. Doc, I want to go out to this movie and have this great time. I say, okay, what are you going to do? Bef 30, about an hour before the movie, you're going to get on the treadmill and walk for 20 minutes, and that's going to buy you four hours to get through that movie. They usually laugh at me, but it's, but it's true. Um, 
The effect affects patients in active treatment, status post treatment, and survivors, and how we manage it is in a stepwise um, approach. However, f- fatigue, severe fatigue can be a predicted shorter recurrence free survival and overall survival in a longitudinal study with patients with cancer. So, if the when we're thinking about fatigue, we usually take it very seriously as a sign. What are the risk factors? Um, now, remember when we say these are just risk factors, but on being unmarried, lower household income, medical comorbidities like heart failure, lung disease, because those also cause their own fatigue, multiple medications that polypharmacy, you come to us with no medications, you leave with 20, we should probably work on that if you're tired. Um, also nutritional issues and people who have these other symptom burdens. So if you have lots of pain, lots of insomnia, constipation, you're more likely to have fatigue. And remember, the treatment-related factors, such as the type of treatment or the dose intensity. So patients will say, I'm not getting treated with strong therapy. Why am I so tired? I'm like, it doesn't matter. I don't. Or patients will say, I don't have tons of disease like this other person over here. I see them on Facebook, and they're going to Europe, and they look amazing, and I can't even put on my shoes. I say, it's not related to that. It's not something you're doing. This is actually a medical problem, which we can try to help manage. We, when you are diagnosed with cancer-related fatigue, we should be going through a differential. So the doctor may ask you about depression. They want to make sure that maybe the medications aren't making you confused or quiet. Make sure you're not anemic. Make sure you're the, the poor sleep. We want to make sure we're not doing this to you with weakness. If people are having to have steroids as part of their treatment, you can get a steroid weakness. Demoralization or existential stress or what we call that spiritual pain. Um, can be related. And then there could also be other comorbidities like heart disease or pulmonary um, illness. So um, making sure that if the doctor orders echocardiograms before treatment, or if you're feeling short of breath and you're tired, that may not be cancer-related fatigue. We need to explore that further, particularly if you're on immunotherapy. Um, Cancer-related fatigue, there are some um, actual places that have cancer-related fatigue have clinics. I think MD Anderson has one. And they do a comprehensive holistic evaluation. Other places that you may find that is in cancer rehab. Cancer rehab tends to be cancer-related fatigue experts, in addition to palliative care. Um, Those may be the two places that you will find the most help with your cancer-related fatigue. Some medications, just sort of uh, some strategies that are non-pharmacologic treatment. This is a study um, looking at cancer survivors, but it also applies to people who are have I mean, ongoing um, active disease, even if that disease is stable. And what really my, rises to the top is mindfulness. Believe it or not, mindfulness is if you had to choose one thing, choose mindfulness. The rest actually are helpful, like acupuncture and cognitive behavioral therapy, yoga, all of that is helpful. Exercise, again, is one of the first treatments, but mindfulness um, is something to add. Um, medication. So when you have cancer-related fatigue, you go to a doctor. The doctor always wants to give you a pill. So I'm tired. Here's some Ritalin. You're like, what? Why are you giving me? You know, I, I, can't, I don't have trouble concentrating. I'm not a child. Well, we know that there's m- many studies that have shown um, low dose methylphenidate, which is Ritalin or the extended release Concerta, um, in low doses can um, help with cancer-related fatigue and the short hour preparations give you about four to six hours. I often order this PRN as needed because uh, patients can usually decide and it gives you some control. Like if I want to do this, I might take my methylphenidate. Hey, today is not so bad. I won't. And there are other things we can use. Um, There are other um, forms of stimulants. The other thing that I think is really important um, to consider, steroids can really help with fatigue, but they have lots of side effects. We often don't go to that. Megase can give you a sense of well-being, and people will give that for appetite stimulation. The problem with that is that doesn't last, and it does have risk of side effects of of, um, MDVTs and increased mortality. And if you're on it for a long time, you can't just stop it because it suppresses your hypothalamic pituitary axis, which means all your hormones. There are some complementary there. Um, therapies, quite a lot of them. These are just two that are common. American ginseng has to be from America. Ginseng, usually grown, the best kind is grown in Wisconsin. 
and um, Guarnera. The problem with these is you have to be very careful because they're metabolized through your liver and you want to make sure that um, it's not going to interfere with your therapy. So always let everybody know, your pharmacist, your oncology team, know what you're taking. Another one that plagues us is mucositis and why I chose to bring this to the top over some of these others because these can really affect the way you eat. And this is a problem because if it hurts to eat and it keeps hurting to eat, you might develop a food aversion. So sometimes people will say, I don't have an appetite. It's because sometimes your brain, if you have mouth sores, remembers that this was unpleasant and it's telling you kind of not to do it. So we really want to, and this is also, you know, it's horrible. So we want to make sure that once you start noticing that burning in your mouth, just don't ignore it and um, let your provider know right away. I say the moment you feel heat in your mouth, you call me, even if you don't see anything. So there's several ways you can prevent mucositis, and I won't go through all of these with you, but I think it's important for you to know that if they tell you their side effects is mucositis um, and they're going to start your treatment, it may be worth saying, hey, doc, radiation oncologist person, um, what could you, is there a way to pre-treat me? <laughs> Do you have something in your arsenal to pre-treat me? Um, many places think about that, but I'm always surprised by how many people, they don't think about that and the patient brings it up. But once you have the mucositis, again, oral hygiene, you got to coat your mouth, the magic mouthwash, the magic mouthwash, and you got to put lidocaine in it. Sometimes eat 30 minutes before. Um, sometimes we'll say something crazy, like give you liquid morphine or liquid oxycodone and tell you to swish and spit. That's a thing because you have pain receptors there and you don't have to swallow it, but swish and spit can be really helpful. And then if it really hurts, you just got to have some oral pain medication. It's usually opiates. Short period of time till it um, resolves. So nausea. So sometimes like um, what I call the bane of our resistant existence because nausea is extremely complicated. So you see, I'm bringing all this up because your key, you know, you have several different nausea centers all over your brain as well in your stomach. And depending on what is being affected influences what medications we use. And often patients say, I was nauseated and the doctor gave me five drugs. This is insane. It actually is insane, but there's a reason and a method to the madness because each part is each part of that nausea, whether it's your chemoreceptor trigger zone, that's where your chemotherapy is making you nauseated, the smells, the sights, the fear of throwing up, that is a real thing. You cannot help it. Um, there's nothing wrong with your brain. It's just your brain saying, this is terrible. It makes me nauseated. So when you see the cancer center, you vomit because your brain's trying to get you not to do that because it's unpleasant. Again, inner ear, um, um, fall, that can also be affected by treatments. And there's a whole host of things that happen in your stomach. So yeah, it's really rough. So these are some of the common um, medications that you see. And I just like to go through these very quickly because sometimes for patients, it's they give you all these medications and we don't know what they're for. So elanzapine, elanzapine is a, actually an antipsychotic, which really makes people upset when we prescribe it and they read it and they're like, oh my gosh, they think I'm crazy. Well, absolutely not. The low dose olanzapine hits the um, receptors in that chemoreceptive trigger zone, which is really, which is usually the prominent thing that's happening to you. And it can calm down the nausea because it cuts down on dopamine. And at the doses we prescribe, usually doesn't make you confused, but it can also increase your appetite. And because and it can lower your anxiety. So I call it, as, it's a nice threefer and doctors love it, but it is hard for patients to get around. And if you're over the age of 65, there is gonna be a black box warning for sudden death. Um, the risk of that is low, but you know we do have to educate you about that. Um, and it can re increase risk of metabolic syndrome, but this is when you're taking it for a long time. You really need to take it at high doses and the olanzapine doses you're being pres just pres prescribed doesn't get you there. A dancitron or Zofran, the savior, does not make you tired, but it will make you wickedly constipated, especially if you're already in it. Constipation is the reason why you're nauseated. This will not help. So, but the other thing to think about with olanzapine, if you tend towards migraine, um, I'm sorry, Zofran or a dancitron, if you tend towards migraines, um, you might get some more. So if you start having a headache, like my nausea is great, but now my head's hurting, it might be that medication. And if you take antidepressants, it also has increases serotonin. So if you feel a little jittery, might be from that. Plochloroparazine, we love it, um, causes a lot of sedations, um, but you can take it up to three to four 
times a day. It is structured after an antipsychotic. So sometimes people will get involuntary movements from it and you just need to stop it and give it Benadryl. Promethazine or Finnegan, an oldie but goodie. You can give it orally, rectal, IV. Um, it's fantastic. Unfortunately, it will put you out. It is um, very, very sedating. And oftentimes people don't like it very much. So you start low and go slow. If you're taking opioids and benzodiazepines, it can put you at increased risk for accidental overdose. Metoclopramide, that's good old-fashioned Reglan. And if you're really constipated, your doctor might use this. If you have slow bowels, where they call it gastroparesis, you might use this. You'd never use this if you have an obstruction. Again, it's structured off of an antipsychotic, so long-term use can give you involuntary um, movements. And Ativan lorazepam, why did they give this to people? Because it helps with anticipatory, anticipatory nausea, but again, it can be sedating and risk of dependence and interact with the other medications. So we try not to use this, although it is a mainstay in infusion sensors everywhere. Other ways, complementary therapies to get rid of nausea, ginger, chamomile, eucalyptus, peppermint, um, wonderful, um, and they actually have um, evidence behind them. The thing we just have to be careful with is that some of these can interact with your therapies. So just run it, if you run it by your cancer um, pharmacologist or run it by your um, oncologist, just make sure people know what you are taking. And if you're gonna get those, probably go ahead and get them from a natural food store or um, a, natu a, a place that um, knows how to dose them versus just buying them off the shelves. Um, insomnia, really hard to get a good night's sleep, but you got to get sleep because that affects everything. So sleep hygiene, um, it really works. The one thing that actually works all the time and more often is sleep hygiene. So you got to turn off your phones, not exercise vigorously. Um, most people aren't drinking wine, but if you drink a little bit, it's going to interfere with your sleep, high fatty foods, and you got to put the cell phone down. The bed is for sex and sleep and anything else, take it to the living room. Um, the other things we need to do, sometimes people can't sleep especially when they have lots of pain, pain will wake you up. So if we control the pain, sometimes you will sleep, you'll come to us with insomnia and you also have terrible pain. The doctor may order your pain medication, not treat your insomnia. It's not that they didn't hear your insomnia, but we think pain is waking you up. Um, shortness of breath will wake you up, right? So if you're not breathing well, your body's always going to try to save its own life. So it may be waking you up because you can't breathe. So if you're wheezing, you have uh, maybe lung metastasis, maybe fluid starting to build up. So shortness of breath, you're waking up gasping. That's not insomnia. There's something wrong. You got to treat your anxiety or depression extremely important, can definitely interfere with your sleep. And being chronically ill interferes with your circadian rhythm. So that's why sometimes we'll recommend melatonin. Melatonin will make you significantly sleepy, but it sets your sleep patterns right. Other things you can take, valerian root and chamomile again. Um, those are more um, natural remedies. And then sedative hypnotics like Ambien or Balsamra. The only problem with these is that they work temporarily and Ambien can be habit forming. It can sometimes be harder to get off Ambien than it is to get off um, um, opiates. And so people can find that really distressing. And when it no longer makes you sleepy, you can sometimes have a hangover effect. Women, we can tolerate about five milligrams of Ambien. Men, we can tolerate about 10. And sometimes when it stops working for women, they want to go up. But the problem with going up, that it becomes more toxic to us. And it just means instead of going up, we need to rotate, but five milligrams is the limits, ladies. Antidepressants, um, trazodone is an oldie but goodie. Um, use it a lot, it can actually turn your mind off. So people tell me I can't turn my mind off at night. I probably might go with a trazodone. Mirtazapine is another one you might see. Um, better for sleep. Um, we just had, there's a recent study that says maybe it's not as good for appetite stimulation as we thought, but definitely helpful for sleep. And nortriptyline um, has been around for sleep in low doses for a long time, but they do have, all of these medications have side effects and can have a hangover effect. So sleep hygiene, sleep hygiene, sleep hygiene. And then sometimes there's a reason why you can't sleep. So make sure you're getting, just don't let people pull, push that off. You know, be cognizant of that and be cognizant of your body. Um, comments, um, anxiety and depression. So this is incredibly important. Most people who experience chronic illness that they're living with for a long time may experience anxiety and depression. And sometimes for the very first time, this is not a moral failing. This is 
actually something physiologic happening to your body and the result of the chronic stress that you're under. So feelings of sadness, literal no pleasure activity. So most people don't always have suicidal thoughts and say, well, I'm not, don't want to kill myself. I'm still doing things. So I'm not depressed. But when I, the question I asked them, when you see your, like, if you love your grandchildren, when you see your grandchildren, you may do the exact same thing you always did with them, but maybe it doesn't feel the same. Are you going through the motions? Are you reaching instead of for the apple? Are you reaching for the Twinkie? Is food kind of you eat, you eat, you don't, you don't. Do you have all of a sudden this fatigue with feelings of sadness and empty, emptiness? Hey, you're all about going for treatments, looking at clinical trials, and now you're just kind of going along with whatever the doctor says or whatever your family says. You're starting to withdraw. That can be a sign of depression. Anxiety, that feeling of worry. You might get dry mouth, tension, and anxiety often affects you physically. So all of a sudden, nausea and vomiting, nobody can figure out why. You're having these palpitations. You're having panic attacks. So um, always consider that. We may not go to that diagnosis first, but we should be screening you for that. So you know, when we think of depression, how do we think of treating it? Well, the things that work best together is therapy and medication. And sometimes patients will say, I just want to do therapy or I just want to do medication. And we go with that and I'm hopeful that it will help. But oftentimes they work better together. In addition to other um, complementary therapies like mind-body medicine. So if you do have access to integrative oncology, um, that's incredibly important because that can be that can give you back some control over things you can do. If the depression is really, really bad, there is treatment for treatment-resistant depression, and that's usually provided by um, psychiatrist. But depression can really affect your ability to participate in treatment. I call that severe depression a palliative care emergency. Um, other complementary treatments, exercise helps. Exercise seems to help with ev everything if you can do it. Yoga, Tai Chi, meditation, massage, and getting into uh, something that you really um, think is important. And also nutrition support. What you eat can also affect how you feel and also how you feel about yourself. So, so who do you actually get help from? Like, so you have these symptoms and who do you ask for? Well, when we think about supportive oncology, you think about a team, a team-based approach to your care. And you may have these depending on where you are located in your, um, how, how your cancer center or what, or what they have available to you. So their cancer um, pain management, management specialists. These are usually doctors, often anesthesiologists, and they're really focused on pain. These are the guys that come with the needles and the procedures, and I say the cool, fancy stuff. Um, if you have access to them and you have pain, always ask to see one. Cancers, there are people who focus specifically on cancer, psychology, and psychiatry. Um, the nice thing about people who do this and work in serious illness space, that counseling is a little different than your traditional counseling. So sometimes people say, I, I met this counselor and what she told me was think positively and feel better. And I'm like, that's not helpful. <laughs> and, you know, because they're not understanding where you're coming from. Cancer physical medicine or rehabilitation specialists, these can be, if you have access to these, these can be game changers. Sometimes they will do prehabilitation. So you're about to go through a therapy that's really tough. You may want to do, um, you may want to do your prehab. Um, if you have disability, you have lymphedema, these are the, these are the people that are helpful and um, can keep you functioning. And that leads to better self-esteem and more stamina. Of course, I shout out to our palliative care specialist. We come as a team. We help manage the symptoms of stress and Ill and anything that's um, bothering you with your serious illness. With our goal is to improve not only your quality of life, but the quality of life for your family. And we provide an extra layer of support. So I often tell patients when I say that illness that definition are like, okay, I still don't understand what you do. I said, whatever is bothering you is what I'm doing at the time. We, our care conforms to you and we fill in those gaps. Um, naturopathic doctors, so NDs, um, are specially trained in naturopathic training. And they can be incredibly helpful if you have access to talk to you about your complementary therapies, your supplements, your diet.
Integrative medicine specialists, these are often doctors, but they do look at you from a whole person perspective and talk about other ways for wellness and healing and various complementary therapies like acupuncture, Reiki. They can sort of guide you if you've never been in that world before. Nutritionist, 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 incredibly helpful in helping you define a diet that will be helpful for you. They can also liberate you from all the things you see on the internet. If you read the internet, you never be able to eat anything. So nutritionists can kind of level set that and really help you sort of tailor and make sure you get your proper calories. And our spiritual health clinicians, not necessarily thinking it from a religious standpoint, although they certainly can help with religious connection and tradition, but they're really there to talk about that meaning, like the why me questions, the anger, all of that issues that relate to our dignity that um, serious illness can rob us of. So the possible takeaways, and I stole this picture from your wonderful website, it is possible to manage complicated symptoms to maximize your quality of life. So if somebody says, well, this is just it, there's nothing I can do, there's always something we can do, and you need to fight for it because you deserve it, you know? You deserve it. You know, we want the whole purpose of having you treat it and for you to go through all this is for you to have the best quality of life possible. We don't want to be the center of your world. We want you and your family and your goals and your dreams to be the center of your world. Um, if possible, as much as possible. If you have access, you need an interprofessional team to support you through your journey. So I know it sounds overwhelming. Oh my goodness, you want to send me to 25 different doctors. Don't think of it like that. Think of supportive oncology like a palliative care buffet, like a medical buffet. You don't need to eat everything on the buffet, but it's nice to know that you have the variety and you can pull these team members in when you need them and put them back on the shelf when you don't. Seeking um, understanding of your symptoms from a trusted source will empower you to be an advocate for yourself and fully participate in shared decision making. It's really hard to work with your provider when you're coming from a disadvantage. So the more you understand about these things and be and feel confident to kind of bring them up, the better you can have a conversation. And I know that's hard and I know that's intimidating. And honestly, that shouldn't be on you, but I'd rather tell you how it, you know, what it is um, versus, you know, the ideal, because this is your life and you only get one shot at it. And all medications and treatments have risks. Um, you have to weigh the benefits versus the burdens of, of treatment. So I tell people there's nothing, there's never anything off the table. And lastly, I'd just like to thank um, everyone, just particularly Living Beyond Breast Cancer, who gives me these wonderful opportunities to talk to people that I, I truly admire and love, like all of you guys out there that I spend my life serving. So again, um, thank you to all of these people, but mostly um, thank you to you for your courage. And the last thing I remember I forgot to say was, um, if you're nauseated, hydration, 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 sometimes IV hydration helps. So I'll go ahead and stop there. But thank you guys. Thank you so much, Dr. Kersine, for that really thorough presentation. Um, you covered so much in, in our short time together. I just want to introduce myself briefly. I'm Janine Guglielmino. I'm Vice President of Mission Delivery at Living Beyond Breast Cancer, and I'm taking over for Marissa to moderate um, the questions that we have. So thank you so much. Um, Dr. Kersine, before we jump into the questions, I, I'm not sure that we ever explained at the beginning what a palliative care doctor is. So could oh. you just speak briefly, just define what, you know, what does a palliative care doctor do and what's your kind of specialty and medical background? Okay, that, that's a really great question. So um, a palliative care, I was sort of thinking of palliative care as a, we're an interprofessional team. So the palliative care doctor is trained in symptom management and communication for people with a wide variety of serious illnesses. And we work with teams of nurses, spiritual health clinicians, um, social workers, counselors to help provide um treatment for physical symptoms, psychological symptoms, spiritual symptoms, and social symptoms. We work together with your with the rest of your team to help support your care. We also help you make decisions when things get hard. So we do talk about advanced care planning. We help you look for the future. And I think, you know, and of how you're going to manage, even sometimes financially, physically, socially. So I just tell people that we are there to pick up what anybody else isn't picking up 
or if you don't know who to take it to, take it to us. If we can't help you, then we help direct you. But it, we're here to make your life easier. So it sounds like people should really be seeing you from the beginning of their diagnosis with metastatic breast cancer. If that's, if someone says, if their doctor says, we're referring you to the palliative care doctor, that doesn't mean that they're at the end of life. No, no. Oftentimes, um, the majority of my patients that get referred who have metastatic um, disease, we're always concerned. But the reason why they're referred is for symptom management. And there's something that is not being covered by their oncology team. So if you have an oncology team, sometimes they're providing primary palliative care when they are managing your symptoms. That's what they're doing. When those symptoms override what they can do in their visit, then they want to bring in that extra layer of support um, to be helpful. And before ASCO, like it's the big oncology um, group of physicians, they said anybody with advanced cancer should have palliative care um, at the start. Now there's a movement to think of precision medicine. So thinking about it, where we enter is where it's going to be most helpful for you. So if you're feeling overwhelmed and these symptoms aren't being managed, then you may need an extra provider. If you're kind of doing okay, you need to understand what we do and be able to pull you in when you need us, but we don't want you just to have extra appointments. So I think that you know a lot is sort of driven. You need to be aware we exist how to find us and be empowered to ask for us and have us come to you when you're ready. Thank you. And that actually bring, brings me to uh, one of our questions from the audience who is at um, a healthcare facility that has an integrative medicine program and um, says that um, where she's receiving treatment, they only have palliative care. Can you explain the difference? What is the difference between palliative care and integrative medicine? So when you think of integrative medicine, integrative medicine, we both look at people holistically, but your integrative medicine provider is going to have training in the complementary therapies, like understanding they may not do your acupuncture, but they may understand what that is and what complementary therapy to help send you to. Because there's so many and it's very confusing. You can spend your whole life and all of your money running around doing all these treatments. So when you see an integrative medicine specialist, they take in your symptoms, do an assessment of you, and then help set you on a path of complementary therapies that should not interfere with your treatment. Palliative medicine, we're a little bit different. We look at you as a whole person, but we are using traditional pharmacology, a little bit of integrative medicine, but we're also spending time talking to you about your goals and values. Like, what do you want? What is going to be most helpful for you? And we stay with you and we change with you. So in the beginning, there may be very few symptoms. As you're kind of in the thick of it, there can be a lot more. So think of our care as more dynamic and we're fit it to you um, versus care that we're sort of developing a static plan for. I hope that's helpful. Thank you. That's that's really helpful. And if someone is not being offered this kind of care through their doctor, what words should they use to, to find the care? That's a really good question. I, we get asked that a lot. Um, and because sometimes oncologists may still associate us with end of life or may think of us in that way. So I'll say a patient essay, you know, I am, you know, Dr. So-and-so, I feel like I'm having all of these problems and you've been helping me so much, but I feel like when I'm here, I really want to focus on my cancer treatment and talk to you about that. Would it be, I, I would like to see palliative care to manage some of these other symptoms. I feel like I need more support. I understand that we're still, I still want active treatment. I'm going to sign, I'm coming to that clinical trial. So I'm not confused about my prognosis, but I, but I, I'm not doing well. I can't continue to do what you're doing and do this. And oftentimes they will hear that and then they will hear the distress because, you know, what the oncologist might be worried about, number one, they care very deeply for you. So they don't want to lose you. It's like inviting another. It's like I say, it's like a medical thruple. Like, you know, we have this relationship. We're doing great. Why do you want to bring this other person? And you explain it. Sometimes they're worried that we may um, 
you know, influence you to not have treatment. And that's not something that we do. So just to assure them that you know where you are in your prognosis and that you're not going to listen to us about that, but you're really going to continue to consult with them. But that's usually the fear. Um, I, I, that that kind of level sets. But once they know that, um, they're, most of the time they say yes, because they want you to feel better. Sure. Thank you, Dr. Kersine. So I have a couple of specific questions. Um, we have someone who says they're having difficulty eating because their, their, their taste buds have been affected by their treatment and mm -hmm. wondering what kind of advice you would provide to someone who's, who's having difficulty eating. And that, that, um, there's, um, there's actually a couple of terms for that, like dyskesia, where it either tastes as metallic, it doesn't taste the way it did before. So we will, oftentimes I'll tell people to try a food that you like, and if it's sweet, make it a little sweeter. If try, think about trying whether it's salt that you have an aversion to, but sometimes salt is what you can taste. So changing the spicing and working with your nutritionist can help. And sometimes trying foods you never thought you liked before. Like I had one person that just decide they like beets one day, never knew why. So sometimes you'll get actually a craving in your brain, like if, like if you were pregnant for something weird, go ahead and try that. That's number one. Number two, food should not be um, anxiety provoking. Because what do we do? You're not eating and then we start pressuring you to eat and then it becomes tension and then you, we give you a big plate of food and you can't do it. So then it, it becomes self-defeating. So you develop an aversion. So what I often tell people is, you know, families need to back off. You need to give yourself some kindness. If you don't eat today, you'll eat tomorrow. Your body does not want you to starve. It's going to kick in. So small meals, eat what you can, get the calories in. But when you do, make it more bang for your buck. For the taste, what we will sometimes use is zinc. So they may give you zinc supplements. The evidence on that is kind of plus minus. The other thing your doctor might do is give you Marinol, which is a medication that is structurally based off marijuana, or they may just, you know, recommend marijuana. And what it does is, you know, traditional marijuana kind of gives you increased appetite, but it also makes food more appealing when it doesn't taste well. So that, so that may be another... Um, Thing that you see um, see us do. But I often use Marinol, which is the medication version of that. And it doesn't work as great for appetite, but often what it's doing is it's getting that terrible taste out of your mouth so you can eat. And then make sure we check for thrush and good oral hygiene, because sometimes the reason is that if your, thung, if your tongue's really coated, we treat that and then you, know, you can taste food again. If you have lost your taste buds, um, about 18 months for them to come back right. Okay, so just to, so again, it will get better over time. It won't stay as terrible as it is, but give yourself about that amount of time to, to sort of eat, taste the way you used to. Thanks, Dr. Kersine. And and someone was asking, they, they live in a state that has, where cannabis is legal. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like cannabis could be a tool in the toolbox for coping with some side effects. Can you comment on that? Yeah. So the evidence, um, the medical evidence behind cannabis is weaker than we would like um, based on how it's scheduled, you know, in, in the U.S. So, so what I tell people, it's not that, you know, if it's, if it's helping you and the doctors say, well, we're not sure, it's because it doesn't reach the level of like their cancer treatment. We just haven't studied in that way. But I do find for some patients, it can be helpful. The higher the THC content, um, the more fatigue and the risk of confusion. And particularly if you're older, the risk of falls. Um, so a lower THC content tends to be helpful and, and most people tolerate that better. Higher CBD contents tend to tend towards more analgesia and anti-inflammatory. Um, CBD by itself um, has antipsychotic properties and can be less anxiety provoking. If you're going to use um, cannabis, I would recommend that you work with your healthcare provider and then also work with a trusted source and learn the strains. So S strain is stimulating. I strain indica puts you in the couch. So sometimes people will try it and they're like, oh my gosh, that was terrible. I never, I'm like, what did you actually take? And um, if you're buying, sometimes you go into like the, if you have stores, 
tell them what your symptom is and they'll help you. And sometimes they'll give you something for the morning and something for the night. And the reason it's not they're upcharging you. What they're doing is giving you something that will keep you awake during the day and help you sleep at night. The high dose THGs like Rick Simpson oil and the full cannabis extract, I try to steer people. I, as a physician, I find that they don't provide the benefit sometimes we're hoping for, and I know many people will disagree, but I do worry about the high THC content for fall sleepiness and apathy where you're just out of it because those are hard to take. I said, the, taking those people who use marijuana like for cancer treatment, that's tough. And it, it hits you just like other cancer treatments. It's not pleasant. So I tell, you know, really sort of think about that and make sure you have um, healthcare providers. If you use it every day, your body will become dependent upon it. If you stop it abruptly, you can go through withdrawal. Thanks for answering that. And I wanted to ask a question from, from Lisa, our chat moderator, who's doing an amazing job, by the way. She says that her nails have started to curl on the sides and they're not growing. Is there anything that she can do to manage that side effect? Uh, biotin supplements can be really helpful. Um, nothing's, uh, you know, Sally's hard as nails. I shouldn't pronounce Sally's, but that's the only brand I know. <laughs> but those um, nail protectors, you know, and I know that's not great, but those are sort of the things we have because what's happening to your nails is, is the effect. I also tell people to keep the nails short, keep the nails short. Um, I have a lot of women who will get gel manicures and that looks amazing. But if your nails thin, when they come off, um, they can make the nail even thinner and sometimes pull off the nail. So I say, if you feel like you really have to do it when it's time, Go back to the manicurist. Do not pull it off yourself because you can actually pull your nail off. But keep them keep them short. Add the supplements, and then also watch through um, your 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 nutrition. And you can also get manicures that where you don't put anything on, but they just really take care of your nail health. Great, thank you. I'm going to ask one last question because incredibly, we're almost done with our hour. And that's about diarrhea as a result of taking CDK inhibitors. And so many folks um, will often get them as, a, as their first treatment. What are some ways to manage diarrhea that you might be experiencing from that? Okay. Um, that's when you're going to need help with traditional pharmacology. They usually start you out with Imodium. And um, if you're taking Imodium and you're taking it up to four times a day, or maybe you're taking two tabs four times a day and you're still going, that's that's not working. So just stop that. The next would be Lamotil. Now, why Lamotil is controlled because it has a little bit of atropine in it and it also has an opiate-like substance. That's what makes it work. You can take Lamotil up to four times a day and sometimes four to six to eight tablets. If you're already on opiates, that can be a little bit of a problem, but that's usually the thing that works. If that's not working, sometimes they'll offer you like a tincture of opium. That tastes terrible. Um, may not work much better than op um, Lamotil, but that's when we're kind of getting desperate. The other thing that you can do to help yourself is hydration, hydration, hydration. And one of the things I wanted to put in the nausea slide is that if we know this is the side effect and we can see how much you're losing, sometimes you can't drink enough to keep up. So we just have to do the hydration to help. Um, sometimes the dose of the medication um, needs to be lowered. Can you fix this with diet and fiber? So that's where it gets tricky because you think if you bulk up the stool and you eat all this bulky stuff, that'll stop the diarrhea. The hard part about that, it's a secretory diarrhea. So your coolness is just doing it. So eating fiber and bulky things can help, but fiber can also create a lot of gas. And then once it's over with, and you've done all that, sometimes you're left with a lot of constipation. But there are diets you can eat, like the brat diet, which will help a little bit with the nausea um, and add, you know, the I tell people try to do like the natural fibers, like bran muffins and things like that, and oats to try to give it a more consistently. But if you if it's too much and you're getting dehydrated and you're hitting the ear all the time, that's when and your oncologist will bring you back and have a, a larger conversation about it. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Kirstie. Oh, can I oh, mention you... one? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Just one last thing, because um, it's hard to put it all in there. For um, one thing on the horizon for um, cancer-related depression, uh, 
Uh, you probably guys have heard of psychedelic medicine or psilocybin or um, ketamine. We, there are lots of clinical trials kind of looking at that because there have been some small studies that have shown that that might be the most effective thing for cancer, depression, and cancer. Um, our country's wrestling with it morally, but um, there is a ton of research in centers for psychedelic uh, medicine. So if you're kind of thinking about that, and there are clinical trials looking at that. So if you're interested in that, that could be it. That that could be it, an option. Thanks for mentioning that, and and um, for talking about the importance of clinical trials in in supportive and palliative care. So hopefully, folks will will take a look at that. 